Hello, everybody. My name is Tom DeDont, and I'm one of the five very dedicated host defense educators. Tonight, we're going to present you some terms from the mushroom world. I've got Gina Rivers Kantla on the line, managing and taking care of any comments and questions you might have. So please feel free to drop some love, drop some questions in that comment section. And don't forget, click the save button, because you may want to watch this more than once. And while you're at it, how about clicking the like and the subscribe button? That'll take care of all of it all at the same time. Now, some of you might know me from one of my nicknames, which is the herbal storyteller. I've been, you know, to use a great Hawaiian term, talking story about herbs and natural products for close to 50 years now. And here at Host Defense, we have a lot of wonderful stories to tell you about mushrooms and their many benefits. And like all good storytellers, we understand that stories mean a lot more to the people who hear them if they understand the words that are used in those stories. <clears throat> so to that end, we put together this brief presentation on terms that are most often used when people are talking about beneficial mushrooms. It's our hope that this will help folks to understand some of the more technical terms and the data associated with mushrooms and how they may be helpful with our health and our wellness, okay? So we're gonna to touch base on a couple of different types of mushrooms. We'll talk about the anatomy of mushrooms and how their different parts work. Uh, then we're gonna review some of the compounds in mushrooms that are supportive of our health and our wellness. And finally, we'll talk about a couple of terms that you might see paired with other mushrooms. So if you're the kind of person who finds watching fungi grow exciting, hey, buckle up, because it's gonna get thrilling from here on out. So macro fungi are what we call mushrooms, come in all different shapes and sizes. That's called morphology. Now, most folks are familiar with the iconic cap and stem type of mushroom, but there are almost as many shapes and forms of mushrooms as your imagination can conceive of. There are the gilled mushrooms like shiitake and agaricus. Polypore mushrooms are often considered the higher life forms of macro fungi, and they often grow on wood, but not always. And they're called polypore because instead of gills, they have pores through which they release their reproductive spores. Now, there are even mushrooms with teeth. Now, and that includes the gorgeous lion's mane mushroom and its relatives like bear's head, which you can see here. And if you thought that was kind of a scary name for a mushroom, wait till you see the club mushrooms. The famous Cordyceps species is a club mushroom, and so are the zombie-like dead man's fingers that you can see in this picture. Now, if you've ever eaten mushu pork at a Chinese restaurant, then the chances are very good that you've eaten wood ear mushrooms, and they're considered to be a jelly fungus. There are fascinating earth star mushrooms, which are a type of puffball. Uh, there are the cup fungi, like the bird's nest mushrooms, and there's even something called a saddle fungi, which is the tasty and highly sought after morel mushroom that you can see here in this last picture. So we're gonna take a minute and review all of the different parts of the mushroom. Most of us are familiar with the mushroom cap or fruit body. Well, there's a lot more to it. The stipe is the stem of the mushroom fruit body. Gills, also called lamellae, are typically found under, on the underside of that cap. The veil is a membrane that protects the fruit body as it matures and the ring, skirt, or annulus is a remnant of the veil. Now, you can often see remnant, remnants of the veil with Amanita species, as well as with, say, white button mushrooms, uh, cremini mushrooms, and portobello mushrooms. Now, some mushroom species have a vulva, which is a bulb at the bottom of the stipe. Spores are the reproductive seeds of the mushroom, but spores are really different than plant seeds. Spores, for one thing, are sexed. And that means that there are multiple sexes represented in the release of spores. And remember, not all mushroom fruit bodies have this morphology or shape. Polypores can take on a variety of shapes and sizes. Many polypores form a conch. Now the conch is a hard woody shell for bracket fruit body, or it can form into a hardened aged, tightly packed mycelium, like for example, the chaga conch. However, with the chaga, the hardened conch is not the actual fruit body, but instead it's something called sclerotia. Schizophyllum commune is a very cool polypore mushroom with false gills on the outer rim of the fruit and the fruit body. And polypores like lion's mane have teeth that are tendril-like structures that house the pores and their respective spores. 
And remember, pores are the openings of the tube-like structures on the underside of the fruit body that allow for spore dispersal. Now, many mushrooms form from the hyphae that are the branching filaments that make up the root-like structure of the mushroom. This is otherwise it's known as the mycelium. The mycelium is the living body of the mushroom. It's the center of all of the mushroom's life functions. Interestingly enough, even the fruit body of the mushroom is composed of highly compacted and laminated mycelial structures that specialize in the reproduction and spore formation of that mushroom. So when we discuss mushrooms, what makes and what makes them beneficial for human health, people often refer to active compounds or constituents that are present in those mushrooms. From a technical perspective, these are referred to as primary and secondary metabolites. Primary and secondary metabolites can be found in the mushroom fruit body and in the mycelium, or they can be secreted into the mushroom's growth substrate. Now, a substrate is a substance in which the mushroom lives and grows and from which it obtains its nutrients. Substrates vary depending on whether the mushroom is growing in the wild or if it's being cultivated. A primary metabolite is directly involved in the normal growth, development, and reproduction of a mushroom, and it usually performs a physiological function in the organism. So for instance, if you look at beta-glucan, one of its functions is the cell wall structure, the rigidity of the cell wall structure. So it also sometimes is referred to as a central metabolite. Now, some other common examples of primary metabolites can include lactic acid or certain amino acids, which can function as antioxidants, like you know, glutathione or um, ergothionine, for instance. Now, a secondary metabolite usually has an important survival or longevity function for the mushroom. Some common examples of secondary metabolites include phenolic antioxidants, uh, quorum sensing compounds, immunological complexes, terpenoids, peptides, and growth factors. Now, one set of compounds that are discussed at length in the mushroom world are polysaccharides and beta-glucans. Each mushroom species has its own set of polysaccharides, and polysaccharides are complex sugar compounds. Some polysaccharides are actually capable of being digested and used by our bodies, while others are non-digestible to us, but utilized by our microbiome. Of the many polysaccharides found in mushrooms, the beta-glucan class of compounds has been the most widely researched and debated. Beta-glucans are primary metabolites of mushrooms, and they create tough cell walls of the mycelium and the fruit bodies. They can also be found in grains like oats, as well as being found in lichens and algae and other fungi like yeasts. Technically, Mushroom beta-glucans are comparable to biological scaffolds, which often contain a number of different structures in them, including polysaccharides. So beta-glucans can have complex saccharides or sugars as part of their structure, as well as proteins, fatty acids, and something called chitin. Now chitin is made of N-acetylglucosamine units, and it's not digestible by humans. Chitin is what makes insect and shellfish exoskeletons so durable. Now remember, not all beta-glucans are the same. It's a very large class of compounds and not all beta-glucans are physiologically active. The beta-glucans that are active appear to trigger cell receptors that engage immune activity within our bodies. So although there is discussion that the polysaccharide fraction of the beta-glucan is the active fraction, it actually appears that that may not be completely accurate. Uh, there is some research that suggests that the fatty acid fraction may be far more active than the polysaccharide fraction. So as you can tell, the bottom line is here that we're learning more and more about beta-glucans all the time. Now here's another secondary compound here. This is the terpenes. And a quick reminder, terpenes are those secondary metabolites we mentioned earlier. Terpenes are alcohol soluble, aromatic compounds that can support our health and our wellness in a wide range of actions. So these are aromatic compounds, which are found in many plants and mushrooms, and they give the characteristic scent, taste, and pigments to the many plants and fungi that they're found in. The most common terpene on earth is alpha-pinene, which gives pine needles their smell. Now, some people say that terpenes are recognizable by their bitter taste, but terpenes have a wide range of tastes associated with them. They can be bitter, they can be sweet, they can be pungent, they can be fragrant. They're arguably the largest class of compounds in nature, and they provide a range of functions for plants and the fungi that, that create them. So there are also things called diterpenes, which are two terpene compounds bound together. The famous compounds in lion's mane, arenacines and ericinones, 
are diterpenes. There are also what are called triterpenes, and triterpenes are highly biologically active as well. Interestingly enough, there's over 300 different triterpenes that have been found and identified in reishi mushrooms so far. And current research suggests all mushrooms contain terpene compounds. Terpenes in mushrooms are still being researched. Some of them are demonstrating immunomodulatory activity, while others, like the arenacines in lion's mane, are demonstrating nerve regenerative activity. Many terpenes are antioxidant, and that means they reduce oxidative damage within our cells. Novel terpene compounds are being discovered all the time now. In mushroom cultivation practices, mushroom mycelium grown on an edible substrate is known as solid state fermentation. Now, mushroom mycelium can also be grown in a liquid culture. And often when the mycelium is grown in a liquid culture, they discard the fermentation broth. This produces a mycelium only product with no fermentation metabolites. Now, mushroom mycelium absorbs nutrients from its substrate or growing medium after it has digested it by secreting enzymes into that substrate. The digestion and the absorption of nutrients from enzymes when it's carried out by bacteria or fungi is known as fermentation. It's very interesting, even as humans, we have two different fermentation tanks in our bodies known as our small and large intestines. In traditional cultures, fermentation was used to preserve foods and to make the nutrients from hard to digest foods more accessible to our, to our body. So some of the byproducts of mycelial fermentation are being studied as biologically supported substances. These include branched chain and short chain fatty acids like butyric and propionic acids, as well as phenolic compounds and other fermentation metabolites. So cultivating mushroom mycelium via solid state fermentation on an edible substrate, such as brown rice, provides access to the compounds found within the mycelium. It also captures the fermentation metabolites produced as byproducts of the mycelial digestion of its substrate. So use of an edible substrate allows for ingestion of this complex combination of compounds after it's been appropriately prepared. Often, mushrooms are, and herbs are used together in formulas and they can work synergistically because they have unique complementary compounds. The following terms are used to describe both mushroom and herbal actions on human physiology. Adaptogens is a term given to a natural substance that assists the body in adapting to both internal and external stresses. The substances generally increase various metabolic functions, including cognitive functioning, muscular functioning, blood glucose uptake and use, hormone regulation, and they can support balanced adrenal gland functioning. Reishi and cordyceps are great mushroom examples of, of an adaptogen. And you've got ashwagandha or eleuthero or rhodiola or holy basil. These are all herbal adaptogens. But please keep in mind, this is by no means an exhaustive list of adaptogens. There are lots of them. Another term you might find is hepatoprotective. Now this refers to substances that are protective to liver cells by a number of mechanisms that may include antioxidant activity or immune modulatory activity. Mushrooms with this type of activity might be included in the chaga, reishi, turkey tail, and cordyceps. Herbs you could look at would be milk thistle seed, turmeric, and burdock root. And these are just some of the examples of hepatoprotectives. <clears throat> Another class that you'll find discussed is prebiotics. And prebiotics are food for probiotic microflora. That's our good bacteria and fungi that are found in our fermentation tanks all beneficial mushrooms that have been tested have been found to be prebiotic. Other prebiotics herbally include burdock root and many other different fibers and that are found in fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds, and so on. So all of these can work as a prebiotic to feed our probiotic microbiome. Another word is antioxidants, and these are molecules that donate an electron to an unstable molecule, which helps prevent that molecule from harming our healthy tissue. All mushrooms contain antioxidant compounds and many, many herbs like ginkgo and, and bacopa and moringa and nettles contain antioxidant compounds as well. Now, finally, we look at a word called demulsants. Demulsants is a Western herbal term for an herb that supports the integrity of our barrier tissue, like our intestinal lining and our skin. Demulsants often form a gel-like substance that moistens and soothes tissue. Marshmallow root and burdock root are great herbal examples of a demulsant. 
Now, when it comes to the brain or neurological function, there are a lot of terms that are used around mushrooms as well. Nervines is a Western herbal term for an herb or a mushroom that calms and soothes the neurological system. These can be, but are not necessarily limited to being sedating. American skullcap is a nerving that in low amounts is calming without being sedating, while California poppy is well known for its sedative activity. The word neuroprotective refers to substances that protect brain and nerve cells. Often, these are antioxidant in nature, and the antioxidant compounds in reishi and cordyceps are very neuroprotective. When you look at the word nootropics, that's a word meaning that the, they're substances that facilitate cognitive functioning. Lion's mane and the herb bacopa are great examples of nootropics. And then neurotropics are substances that stimulate stem cell differentiation and encourage nerve regeneration and healthy function. Examples of a neurotropic are lion's mane and reishi mushrooms. And then we have neurogenesis. And neurogenesis is the process associated with the creation of new brain and nerve cells. And there you have it, folks. I hope that this has expanded not only your mushroom vocabulary, but also your understanding and your enthusiasm for mushrooms. And don't forget, click that like button, click that subscribe button, and please come visit us as many times as you like. We love having you here.